by Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee for a wide ranging interview about her brand new book, The Mind of a Conservative Woman, which I found to actually be a very indelible read. There are a lot of political books out there and I think this one spoke to me a lot recently as a conservative woman and also as someone who works in a pretty intensive career. So Senator Blackburn, I'm really excited that we can finally have this conversation about the book and kind of current events on your mind. Oh, thank you. I am absolutely delighted to join you and so glad that the book, that you found the book to be an inspiration because that's exactly what it is in intended to be there to explain what conservatism really is because you know if you listen to the mainstream media they would have you believe that conservatives are so out of style you know i think it is so important that we go back and look at what conservatism really is who are conservatives how have they played a role in our history what is it that conservative women today bring to the debate when we talk about issues that affect our lives, jobs, security, health care, and how do conservative women look at those issues? And we have to add how the media treats conservative women, which is to push conservative women to the side and say, you know, we really don't want to hear from you or know what your opinion is. Yeah, I've seen that in my own endeavors, not on a grand scale like you or, or the women who obviously have a, a higher profile, but it really is true that conservative women get routinely attacked. It's not our thinking, it's not us in a little bubble, but I think the evidence shows that conservative women are generally more critiqued than women on the left. And I found your book to be kind of part memoir, part how-to, and part kind of conservative blueprint. I love the fact that you offered advice and books for young women and even young men to read too. And what was your thinking behind that? Do you, do you think that a lot of books in politics kind of lack that context in addition to the overview and in, in your backstory? Yeah, you know, what I wanted to do was have it It'd be a little bit of how to, uh, a little bit of memoir, and then kind of an action plan, how you put this to work for you, how you draw on the experiences, whether they're my experiences or someone else's, and you use that as young women I'm talking to now, young moms who are saying, you know what? I'm going to get involved in my city council, my county commission, my school board, because of what they've seen happen to their children during this era of COVID. And I think it is going to be conservative women that will lead the way back to a normal life for so many communities. And I am thrilled with that. So my book does do that. This is a little bit of my story. And then I different adversities and how you today can face adversities, how things have changed since I started my career and the doors that are open for women now that never would have been open 20 or 30 years ago. It is true especially with women in politics. And obviously we saw it this past election, much to the chagrin of the media, political observers, prognosticators, conservative women made tremendous gains in the House of Representatives and a little bit in the Senate too, with the addition of Senator Lamas. And finally, Claudia Tenney was able to assume her seat and should the special election go in Republicans' favor, which looks to be the case, the widow of the Congressman who was supposed to serve looks to be joining uh, the ranks of Congress too. So obviously we have those gains. Do you foresee women making more gains on the right, electorally speaking, in wake of COVID, kind of just what they see happening in Washington right now? Yes, I think women are saying enough is enough. And this country is worth fighting for our children's futures are worth fighting for. So they are standing up and they are pushing back. And one of the interesting things from this past election cycle is that there are more conservative women serving in public office than ever before. 
and you saw some tremendous gains in 2020 at the local and state level. And those are not talked about often enough, but we know that those are individuals who will one day step up and work, run for federal office or serve in administrations. And we're thrilled to see those gains. Yeah, I think we're going to see more women run, especially like you had mentioned parents perhaps energy workers, because we see a lot of people, especially women too, who work in the energy sector who are displaced. And I wanted to touch a little bit upon energy. Uh, you talked about conservation a little bit on in your book, something I like to talk about and ask Republican lawmakers like yourself, what do you think is a conservative conservationist ethos? And do you think conservatives are tackling that issue better? Is it already kind of innate and we're just being more vocal about it? Or is it something new? I always love to mention that Teddy Roosevelt is the one who pushed the conservation effort forward. And I think it's a very natural thing for those of us on the center right to be conservationist. And I really got a lot of my leaning on this from my mother, who was very involved in making certain that we always left things in better shape than we found them, and that we appreciated what the good earth and the good Lord had put in place for us to be able to use. So yes, uh, being able to conserve and clean up our environment so that the area around us is, is clean and is kept for future generations. That is something that we should do. We're all in favor of clean air, clean water. It is important that we take steps to make certain for that. It is important that we think about uh, what we do in the area of preservation when it comes to appreciating our nation's history, our landmarks, appreciating those that have uh, come before us. And I've enjoyed being a part of those efforts in my community. And um, I, one of the things that was really so much fun, Keep America Beautiful gave my mother their Lifetime Achievement Award in 1997. And it was so exciting to see her as someone who had always worked hard through her work with homemakers clubs and FCE clubs and the Garden Club had worked to stress how important it is to clean up our highways and our byways, to clean up areas that you're passing every day. Don't depend on somebody else to do it. Do your part to improve areas and make certain that they are well-kept and well-maintained. Also in your book, something that struck me as really fascinating is you talking about being a sole proprietor prior to going into public office. And there's kind of a looming issue, something I've written about, I just wrote about this in town hall, about the threat to sole proprietorship, self-employment with the PRO Act. Has that been something on your radar? And are you concerned that that could be past kind of unchecked and adversely affect your constituents in Tennessee? What we know in Tennessee is a lot of people function as independent contractors, sole proprietors, self-employed. And this past year, as we were working on the CARES Act, I worked with Marco Rubio, who chairs the Small Business Committee to make certain that they were included in the definition of a small business. The reason for that is you've got a lot of people, especially women, who prefer to be a, a consultant or an independent contractor back to an entity. They don't want to be someone's employee. They want to be able to utilize their skills and to run their own shop, their own business. I think that's a, a really wonderful thing. And it's something we should celebrate. And there are those that are pushing against what is called the gig economy. And they are pushing forward with legislation that would give the ability to unionize gig economy workers. And this is aimed at many times as the, at those that are working with Uber or Lyft or maybe individuals that have set up their own business that is a lawn care business or a, um, a home uh, cleaning service. So what we want to do is preserve that right to work for an individual to structure 
their work and to be able to participate in um, their version of the American dream and do it without mandates from the federal government. And what do you see happening if that were to proceed? Uh, have you followed California's AB5? I think that's a template for what the president, some in his cabinet, and a lot of congressional Democrats, and a few actually congressional Republicans want to support too, I think. Well, what you would see is a lack of opportunity for individuals to have their own business. Because when you erect a barrier, then you make it more difficult. And what we should do, I think we as Republicans should actually change GOP from standing for grand old party to standing for great opportunity party. And we should put the focus on how we increase opportunities for individuals to enjoy their version of the American dream. That should be our goal. Not how do we limit it? How do we make it more difficult? How do we give big business more control over them? We want them to be able to make their own decisions. I would hope more Republicans uh, kind of heed your advice and do that. And, and maybe that'll come when the bill is to be debated. Uh, but, but hopefully more do understand that because that is kind of an emerging frontier. Many of us writers and journalists like myself, we make our livelihood off of it. We love the arrangement, the flexibility that comes with it. And that's an issue I would hope the party kind of takes, takes close to heart. But I want to speak a little bit about the future of the Republican Party. We hear observers say that due to kind of obviously the past electoral losses or some of the electoral gains, people are wrestling with kind of the identity of the Republican Party. But I understand it to be you have to kind of take the successes of the last four years, which there were many, and perhaps maybe have different messengers. Some say that you have to eliminate what they call Trumpism away from the Republican Party. Do you agree with that sentiment, disagree with it? And what do you think the future of the Rep Republican Party looks like in conservatism at whole? First of all, I think President Trump is going to continue to be a, a very important voice in the Republican Party. And I am grateful that he brought so many Americans that felt disenfranchised to the political conversation. And really, uh, they saw him, they gravitated to him because they saw him as giving voice to their concerns, their fears, their hopes, uh, their belief in themselves. And as we talk about the future of the Republican Party, I really do think changing that moniker so that it is not grand old party, but it is great opportunity party and putting the emphasis on the individual and giving them the tools that are necessary for them to achieve their dreams, their hopes and their dreams in, in life. That is paramount. The other thing I think we have to remember is that our party has always been united around core principles. And that is a, a strong defense. It is individual liberty. It is freedom of speech. It is a strong and robust private sector, free enterprise. And when you keep that focus on freedom, free people, free markets that are core to us, because, and, and that's important to do because issues are going to change. If you go back and you look at the past five or six presidential elections, there are a lot of issues that change, but there are some things that are constants. A strong economy, keeping taxes low, keeping government right-sized, keeping the military strong so that they can defend us, standing up for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for freedom, for justice, for equality. Those are things that remain a constant. And I think Republicans would be well served to realize when we focus on those fundamental truths, those foundations, when we focus on good policies that come from those constitutional rule of law, freedom-based uh, underpinnings, 
we are going to win. And I wanted to conclude with asking you about how you're enjoying your foray into podcasting with Freedom Rings. I've been able to catch a few episodes. I really love that it's kind of short and truncated and you have really very interesting guests, obviously talking about freedom and just their different platforms. So how do you feel about podcasting? Do you think Republicans, other elected officials like yourself should tap into that format a bit more? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things we know is that individuals are building out their own network of how they receive information. And it is really a wonderful opportunity to put conservatives out there so that conservatives have someone that they want to listen to. So I think that is going to serve us well. I am really pleased with how it's going and I really look forward to being able to continue Freedom Rings. And people will find it at freedomringspod.com. Excellent. And Senator Blackburn, where could people connect with you in your office and follow your legislation and anything else that is trending uh, from your corner of the United States Senate? Yeah, they are always going to be able to find me at Marsha Blackburn online. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Senator Marshall Blackburn, for chatting with me about your book. And I will encourage uh, viewers and listeners to get it. They could get it at Amazon. It's a very great read. I appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to chat with me. And perhaps someday in the future, we could interface in person. I would love to gather your thoughts more on what's happening in Washington and in your state as well. Absolutely. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. You too, Senator Blackburn.